Okay. Uh, so my name is Daniel Christopher. Uh, I first got exposed to Bhakti Yoga or the Hare Krishna movement when I was 16 years old. So that's 10 years ago now. And I was just a little punk rock, <laughs> rebellious activist kid. And I went to the Vans Warp Tour for the first time. And as soon as I stepped out of the car, I met this tall, tall dude with bald hair and big eyes. And he looked like he was full of so much love. And it looked like he knew something about life. So he sold me a book about Krishna and yoga. And I gave him a donation. And then I didn't really know what that was about. I was only 16. So then another... Um, Four years later, um, I ran into another devotee, and he was like, hey, there's this center down uh, in the uh, downtown area. So every Wednesday night, they study philosophy from the Bhagavad Gita. Every Sunday, they have dancing and singing and free vegetarian food. So uh, I was like, cool. You know, that sounded right up my alley. So, 20 years old, uh, that's when I started uh, coming to the temple and practicing the meditation and chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, studying the books. And um, so, that has been my particular practice and path for the most part in the last six years. And aside from that, uh, I have interests in many of the different world religions and spiritual traditions and philosophies and different ideas and things. So philosophy is my thing. Um, and I'm also really into activism, especially utilizing farming and sustainable living and cooperative living as a model for uh, creating a social renaissance and transforming the whole planet. So. Wow. That's kind of where my life has led me. Uh, yeah, I, uh, my parents uh, bought me a set of golf clubs when I was 18, and they thought I was going to be a, a lawyer. So they're like, here, you'll be able to use these and uh, whatever. So I ended up going to college for like two years, dropping out. Yeah, realized it wasn't for me, and I started smoking uh, marijuana so that had a pretty huge transformative effect on my life um, yeah my first experience was kind of just like this cosmic awakening um, a loss of individual ego a disillusion of physicality everything just became floating energy and different forces of nature you know, like an ocean just floating around. So that was my experience. So that, that led me into um, smoking a lot for a few years, uh, taking LSD, taking psilocybin mushrooms, stuff like that. I never really got into any hard drugs or anything, but I was only interested in mind-expanding drugs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. So that's a little bit about my journey. Um, I got into permaculture uh, in 2013. Permaculture is an ecological movement designed to try and uh, shift the trajectory of human society by teaching people how to reintegrate themselves as a component within the whole ecosystem of nature. So it covers like natural housing, uh, catching rainwater and filtering the water, growing your own food, of course, um, and how to create communities and things like that. So the permaculture movement started in Australia in the 1970s with a, unity prof a university professor and his student. So they came up with the idea, they launched the movement, they went around the world, they studied from various indigenous cultures who were still living off the land entirely. So they utilized those techniques and those methods um, so yeah, permaculture, it's this whole system of thinking and approaching how to live in harmony with nature 
and myself and the people around me. So uh, it's a pretty relevant movement. I would say it's one of the more prominent things that are doing good for the world. So I got into that around 2013, just started planting tons of fruit trees and rebuilding ecosystems on my parents' uh, farmland. So I spent about four years there just covering it in trees and uh, trying to create a, um, an ecosystem that's similar to what was there present before the Europeans came and cut everything down. So trying to restore ecosystems, trying to revegetate the planet. As if, there's more, if, there's more, if we plant more trees and vegetation on the planet, it'll change the atmospheric conditions. So, you know, it's in our best interest to be more of a human being and less of a consumer zombified robot. Yeah, definitely, definitely, I feel that. Yes, <laughs> that brings me to my next point, which is that um, we're, we're in a very unique situation in the world history. So the point we're at is like, we can understand a lot about ourselves just by looking at the world that we live in. So why do we have this world that's run by criminals and corporate masters and these kind of evil, greedy, um, they're, not, they're not in it for humanity, they're not in it for enlightenment, they're just in it for their own power and money. So why do we have that kind of leadership in our world? And also, why do we have a world that's full of collapsing ecosystems and pollution and it's ridden with so much suffering and uh, so much destruction? So why are we as humanity on this trajectory towards self-annihilation? It's because that's what's in our heart. So that's why it's important that we don't just become activists and protesters and pointing our finger and blaming the system the man, whatever, but really seeing the reflection there and understanding the deeper metaphysical um, perspectives on things. So we don't just play into the victim mentality anymore, but we really start to see that this world is falling apart because I don't have my own shit together. So I am, I am the world and the world is me. And so the ugliness of the world is simply a matter of my own heart. So it's really about cleaning up our heart. And the fastest, most effective way to clean up our heart is drop who you think you are, um, drop the mainstream normal lifestyle, um, grow your own food, go vegan, start putting in the time, sit down, meditate with yourself, and study the ancient books like Bhagavad Gita. Definitely. Connect with all of these great teachers who have left us so much wisdom. So these people came to this planet not because they're like us and they have selfish desires that they have to get a body and they have to play out these selfish desires for satisfaction. But these enlightened teachers, they came to our planet out of mercy and they came here to create a ripple effect that would take the world by storm and create a loving, compassionate, enlightened society. So that's that's the direction we're headed, but we've got a long way to go. Yeah. So at least we're lucky in that sense that the good news is that we've already started. So the hardest part is, you could say, over. But... Um, so where are we at with time? Uh, we are at 4.30. So pretty much, I'll let it run through. I can give a couple yeah. little points. It's beautiful that you speak about the growing of fruits and vegetables and changing the ecosystem and changing our hearts because really is our hearts that are expressed outwards. This, this, uh, our, our consciousness really transforms what we see and all together we can transform this whole world even though we are in the it's beautiful stuff man yeah so what i want to talk about is i want to go towards leading towards um 
like uh, from the Hare Krishna movement, your spiritual sadhana, the whole chanting of Hare Krishna, the whole reading of the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam, mm -hmm. what are some main points that you pulled out of this? Or some, some, some like juicy knowledge that really transformed the way you see the world? Mm. Well, the first, uh, your first experience, most likely, if you walk into a Hare Krishna temple, is that you're going to hear a few basic uh, key concepts, such as you're not your body, um, you're not your mind, but actually you're an infinite, infinite, eternal spark of God. You know, so that's kind of like non-Western, it's not part of the mainstream narrative that everybody is, is adhering to. So even the most basic elementary philosophy and message of the Hare Krishna movement, it's, it's already from the get-go so radical and so extreme. Yeah. It's taking you to another plane of consciousness and it's giving you the keys to the kingdom of God. It's giving you the way out of all of all of this miserable, cyclical, habitual, repeating patterns that are unhealthy and harmful to ourselves and the planet and the ones around us. So this is all a reflection of self-hatred and disconnectivity from the universe. Yeah. So yeah. we want to become more connected to everything. We want to become more connected to ourselves, our community, to the planet, and to the Supreme God. So um, the next thing I would say is probably the more juicy side of the philosophy. Um, I remember I was like 19 or 20 and I, I came to the temple and I saw uh, this big, beautiful picture of Krishna playing his flute in his own little fantasy world. And I was just so compelled by it. And I was thinking like, this is so ancient. There's so much wisdom in this. But because of the conditioning of the, the present um, dominant culture, they try and make the decision what is reality and what is not. You know, so they use mm -hmm. science and all these things that they've basically made up to try and control people's opinions. So when the common person sees a picture of Krishna, they're... At best, they're probably going to say it's some kind of ancient mythology, some kind of superstitious ancient religion or yeah. something. Pantheon of just like, might even look at it like a cartoon. Oh, absolutely. Totally. They think it's something completely made up because they can't imagine beyond their five senses or what happens in this world. Mm -hmm. When the fact of the matter is that there's many, many worlds many levels and planes of consciousness aside from this one. So that's what this ancient knowledge coming from the Vedas, the Upanishads, all of these texts are bringing us back in touch with that mystical origin of reality, the mystical origin of consciousness itself. So the idea that they're presenting the supreme consciousness as a form, a, a person, a character, a being. Um, for me, that was somewhat, it wasn't a new idea, but it was an idea that I wasn't that comfortable with anymore because I had already gone through Buddhism and different philosophies of that sort. So I was, I was thinking that, um, you know, we're all one energy and that's the, that's the last fact. That's the bottom line. We're just all one. So coming to the Hare Krishna movement, and they're taking it to the next level, Definitely and they're not. saying, yeah, we're all one is just the beginning. <laughs> it goes much farther than that. Because within that oneness, you can have simultaneous um, individuality. Uniqueness. Yeah. Yes, unique. The, the good news, I guess you could say, is that, yeah, we're, we're all one, we're all connected, and we can experientially feel that connection when we start to declutter our mind, our emotions, our blockages, 
when we start to soften our heart and open it up to each other and open it up to the cosmic divinity. So the good news, we're all one, but at the same time, there is diversity and there is variety and there is activity. So in order for that to also exist, there has to be individuality, there has to be um, self-standing units of consciousness and perception. So it, both are true, we're all one, but I find that the message that we're all one is kind of being co-opted into this um, kind of stagnant level of practice or stagnant um, space because it co-ops us out of being individual participants in our own reality. Um, it co-ops us out of being able to um, very intimately connect and unite and create our own reality. So by embracing our individuality and our uniqueness, with the understanding that we're all one, this is what the Hare Krishna movement is really trying to give the world, a very enlightened state of consciousness where you're aware of the multidimensionality of life, you're aware of all these different features and components and forces that are at play making this experience that we're having what it is. So if we can understand this experience for what it is, and we can understand our own identity, our own eternal placement in the big picture, then um, that is the perfection. That is the purpose of the whole cosmic creation, is for the individual units of perception to go through this whole crazy journey and then come out the other end and awaken and reunite. So that's what God likes to do. <laughs> yeah, would, would you like to talk about the whole love aspect the whole bhakti aspect the, the opening your heart and the letting go of the false ego and going into the true ego the, the soul mm -hmm. or, and then your relationship with the super soul within you know, Jiva and the super soul yeah. yeah your experiences with that uh, unconditional love so, uh, I've take like I said, I've taken LSD and magic mushrooms and these different kind of substances. And they, when I was more younger, those were the things that really had the highest quality and caliber of mind-blowing experiences. But as I started to practice more and more, uh, chanting Hare Krishna, following the the sadhana and the, the suggested lifestyle for spiritual awakening. Um, my experience was that I've had several, I was sober and I just had completely um, heart melting. Yeah, that's the mind blowing stuff right there. Yes. And it was just, I was just chanting and yeah. everything was kind of connected in that moment. And this whole like force of like a tidal wave of love and affection and devotion just kind of awakened within me. And that was a huge step forward for sure. And now I'm just kind of working off of that experience and trying to understand that deeper and trying to bring more of that in and create more of that. So, um, before we have any kind of spiritual practice, we're very much bound up by our desires and by the fluctuations of the mind. So at the beginning, a lot of spirituality is just about getting your mind in check, you know, sitting down, mm -hmm. disciplining yourself, uh, developing your willpower and your concentration. These things, however, are just for beginners. They're not truly the spiritual... Uh... So... The real fruit from spirituality is not um, stress relief or even tranquility or joy, but the real fruit of spirituality is that you become a completely 
integrated and awoken component of reality so you can function on the level you're meant to function instead of functioning with all of these uh, useless limitations like the fact that we live in physical bodies this is a limitation which we actually as a pure conscious soul we actually don't even need a physical body to exist so for one this physical body is a source of so many problems and I'm addicted to living inside this physical form that's why I took on another body and that's why I may after this life continue to take on more physical forms because of that deep heart uh, tied knot mm -hmm. so we want to break these knots in our heart and we want to develop transcendental wisdom so when we develop that wisdom we understand I'm not the body I'm not the mind what what am I really in, and what do I really want out of life what do I want to contribute so this is the fruit of spirituality is understanding your place in life and understanding that you have something unique and something creative that you can contribute that nobody else has so you have that little piece that will complete the picture and every one of us has that we have this very innate special essence which we must uh we must try our best to uncover this treasure that's within so the love and the devotion aspect of bhakti makes it unique because it's pulling from the most personal aspects of one's being um for instance when you're doing the the ceremonies as part of the bhakti process you know you're lighting the incense you're lighting the candle there's these different things and we're offering them to the transcendental being krishna and the different expansions of krishna at first it's just somewhat mechanical you know you're offering incense to the lord what happens is eventually you want to express some kind of sentiment and some kind of feeling along with the um me mechanisms the form it's not enough to just have the religion part down but we have to go deeper and have some kind of affection and some kind of deeper participation in our practice it can't just be a mechanical thing that we just do we can't just sit down and breathe in and out for 20 yeah. minutes and really think we're doing something um incredible it is good mm -hmm. but also you know taking a 15 minute jog is good for you so you know taking care of your physical self is good but the spiritual thing is completely different it's really about something that we can't even understand until we get the mercy yeah so by showing up and consistently putting in effort the mercy will descend you will attract the mercy when your heart becomes soft and you become ready for higher consciousness until then we're trapped in the false ego we yeah. think we're something we're not and so we live out this life doing things that don't even make sense to our true self so we're so lucky to live in a time where we do have things like the Hare Krishna movement because it's making spirituality, yoga, meditation, reincarnation, ancient wisdom, it's making it available to anybody wherever you're at in the world, whatever age you are, you know, it's creating a true unity amongst the world. And there's many other spiritual movements, mm -hmm. um Hindu movements, Buddhist movements, so many different movements that are doing good things but i would say the hari krishna movement is probably somewhat more unique in the sense of understanding how they came about understanding the rapid worldwide explosion that happened in 60s and 70s yeah so yeah, i'm pretty sure to that end yeah but yeah it's not even biased though, not even biased that we're hard Christians. It's like we've been through Zen Buddhism, Buddhism, Taoism, or like... The Krishna movement is coming down from a higher plane of consciousness. It's not just a good idea that someone came up with and wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. This is something that's much deeper and it's much more involved in a cosmic level, like cosmic cycles. 
So right now, we're going through this dark period on this planet, but at the same time, when we understand the bigger picture, we understand why there is turmoil and why there is fighting and conflict and drama within this world. It's hard to understand, it's hard to explain, but it's, a, it's sort of like for the, for the sake of play, for the sake of um, some, some tension, some activity, some movement, some interaction. So the one becomes many, it fragments itself, and then it plays these different games in order to express different um, feelings or experiences. And so we might be living in this dualistic world that's full of suffering and misery, and there's all this fighting going on and whatnot. But at the same time, we're living in in kind of like a um, classic Star Wars scenario <laughs> where we have uh, the evil dark empire that's covered the whole globe and they're controlling everyone's minds and poisoning them with food and water and poisoning the air and whatnot. And then we're just this small band of like rogue uh, Jedis and we're coming in and we're like, well, we have the universe on our side because the universe fundamentally seeks, you know, the light and the good and the positive and these lower vibrations, they can't exist beyond this realm of consciousness, this third 3D density. Only duality can exist here. Uh, so we came here because we had certain lessons to fulfill certain experiences that we desired mm -hmm. and now we're, we're getting much more than we bargained for but at the same time you know it's like this is becoming somewhat of a tangent but it's like we have to recognize our own faults so we can accept like I came here because I have selfish desire yeah. at the same time we should look at the transcendental perspective and think, I don't even have des those desires. I don't even have a selfish ego. Eternally, I am pure love. I am pure spirit. So these temporary desires are just, um, they're just part of the play. They're part of the process unfolding. And we shouldn't get too hung up on them. We should try to get over them the best we can. And certain desires are not going to go away that easy. The desires, you know, for sex and drugs and uh, fame, reputation, all these things are very difficult to overcome. But there is a mass spiritual awakening happening, <clears throat> and especially amongst the youth. People who are like 15 to 25, they're so ready for something new. Definitely. So I think, um, I think it's all about creating the new the new world creating the sustainable loving harmonious culture that we feel is is right and is good uh -huh. so that's what i try to do by utilizing small farming and outreach and teaching about uh yoga and gardening and everything yeah, so, and yeah we can have more sessions but i've got to get going now I have one more question. Um, any spiritual master you'd like to call out? Uh, yeah, my, my spiritual teacher, Hanuman Prashak Swami. He's a transcendental madman. <laughs> He's experiencing a level of enlightenment that I can't understand and that probably few people can actually comprehend. And outwardly, he just appears as a normal old man. <laughs> um, but I've spent time just living alone with him and learning from him and he's shared experiences with me that completely reshaped the trajectory of my life so nice. Hanuman Prashak Swami is a genius I go for that. yes yeah, so my spiritual teacher um, I met him while traveling around some people connected me with him and so I introduced myself and he told me his vision for the future and I felt like I was very much already aligned with that vision 
Um, so he basically told me to uh, start farms all over the world and help bring humanity back into alignment. And so my spiritual teacher, he um, he was coming from that like 60s hippie era. Uh, he went through uh, Berkeley and graduated top of his class in psychology and quantum mechanics. And then he went, he was kind of burnt out with Western academic thinking. So he went and he joined uh, the Second City Theatrical uh, Drama Group in Chicago. And that's where he said, he told me he learned a lot about the divine within mm -hmm. through being on stage and being an actor and things. You learn where this source of inspiration is coming from. Originally, it's coming from God, because God is the most creative, um, the most exciting, the, mo the best storyteller, the best uh, everything, you know? So theater and drama is a great way for us to actually understand life because it takes us out of the narrow-mindedness of intellectuality and it brings us into a, a deeper kind of creativity and spontaneous intuition. So that's kind of where I'm at in life, I guess. So it's been very nice connecting with you and I'm looking forward to more... Uh, more sessions like this yeah one. yeah be beautiful oh yeah it's in a beautiful session so and, yeah uh, nice, nice and meeting you steven nice meeting you daniel uh his instagram i'll put it down in the bottom right here it's uh rainbow dharma and his youtube channel i'll put it all down in the link below and uh, hi krishna hi krishna namaste <laughs>